Uh, hi, uh, we're sitting in um, Dufferin Grove Park in Toronto, and uh, I'm talking with uh, my friend Louis Jacob. Um, uh, you might know Louis as one of uh, Canada's uh, more prominent artists, um, but, uh, but I know him as one of uh, Canada's greatest living philosophers. And so uh, I wanted to uh, talk with him about that, about, about uh, some of I've the... I've got a good publicist going, yeah. so like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to talk with him about something about the relationship between uh, his uh, philosophy and his art. Um, but so maybe, Louis, uh, we could start by you just saying something about um, your involvement with philosophy, how you got involved in it, or how, how it has... Uh, been present mm. in your life, something like that. Mm -hmm. I was thinking on my bike ride here, uh, how I guess I imagine throughout life, but certainly when we're in school, like in university, and deciding what course to take, uh, it feels like we're like knocking on doors and then seeing what opens and seeing if what opens has an avenue behind it or not. Uh, I know that. You know, when I had to enroll in university, I was a kid. I didn't know anything. I didn't know what I wanted. I didn't know much. Uh, and so this experience of taking a class, seeing if the door opens, seeing yep. if there's an avenue felt very palpable. And a lot of the time, the door doesn't open or there's not much behind it that resonates. Uh, but certainly philosophy opened up an avenue that I feel like I'm still traversing. So, uh, I, I feel like a little bit like an interloper talking to philosophy students because I'm not like in depth in researching philosophy or knowing Kant and all these people. Uh, but I do feel that my contact with philosophy um, awakened something in me uh, that I, I can, I'm happy to talk about. Yeah. Well, sticking with that theme about school, um, I guess you weren't particularly drawn to art classes. Is that right, or what? That is right. Uh, I I never studied art. I mean, I actually did take an art studio class, and it was evident from the first two weeks that it's, it it had nothing to do with what interested me about art. I took art history, and that was more interesting. Uh, but also, it seemed like it it was it, it didn't connect to what I was looking for. Uh, however, philosophy and semiotics did connect more strongly to what it was that I was looking for. Uh, and I don't know, studying like Merleau-Ponty and Heidegger with you definitely was like, uh, you know, a big opening uh, for me. Um, but like, maybe we could just stick with art for a minute. Um, mm -hmm. uh, can you try to put into words a little bit of what you take art to be? Yeah. Um, so I don't, I didn't grow up in an environment in which art was anything really. Uh, I imagine like most people, you know, our family didn't go to galleries or museums or anything like that. So it wasn't like a real thing in my environment. Uh, uh, and when I was a teenager, I used to spend a lot of time in libraries. Uh, and I would just, I don't know why, but I would just go to the art section, just grab a pile of books and just flip through books for hours every day. Um, and that's kind of become a technique yeah, <laughs> for me right. now I, as I well yeah. uh, uh, in my art making. Uh, so art for me at that moment was, I think it was an idea that there's a different world that I have no clue about. You know, I remember seeing in exhibition, like photo in books, photographs of exhibitions of minimalist art. So you'd see a room with like a square on the wall and a cube on the floor. <laughs> yep. And and it revealed to me there's a whole sociality in the world that I have no clue about, where someone is making a square someone's making a cube and then somebody else wants to show it and somebody else wants to photograph it and somebody else wants to write about it and somebody else wants to publish yeah. a book about it and i felt what are what are these people <laughs> about um uh and then also in high school i through my friend barbara 
I got connected to zine culture. Mm -hmm. So she she told me about zines, and we started making a zine, and uh, I was an alienated teenager, like I imagine many people are. Uh, but making the zine and making absurd, nonsensical texts, images, collages, photocopying them, making posters and plastering them all over the, the school, um, making public announcements during homeroom that made no sense and that were like Dada <laughs> music or something. Um, I realized then I, the definition of art that's still operative for me and that is that art is not really making a nice picture and putting it on the wall or trying to represent something. It might be those things and it is those things a lot of the time. But more fundamentally, I realized that art is a way to change your environment. Like mm -hmm. by making that poster, making that public announcement, uh, making that collage, that manifesto, and putting it up, I'm suddenly not that alienated teenager in that same way. Uh, something of my psyche or my perspective now occupies space and that is a real thing that other people contend with as I contend with it and suddenly I'm not alienated from my environment from other people uh, I may not have more friends but but some my reality is shifted and I realize that's more what art is about than simply making a nice picture to look at uh, is we transform the environment through that picture or through that whatever the art form is. Um, are there are there things that you studied in philosophy that uh, particularly resonate with or, or inform that orientation that mm -hmm. you have? Well, I guess a couple of things like, you know, when we're studying Heidegger, you know, he can be so frustrating because his language is like Martian like it's just such a weird language yep. and you know as, a, as, a, as an undergrad you're just like hitting yourself on the head with this book because you're like please make sense uh, and it doesn't for a long time um, uh, and one of the things that you kind of beat yourself up about is what does he mean when he talks about that sign he says that sign that sign that sign but what is that? That's like such a weird word. What is in he just use person or self or, mm -hmm. you know, human or, or consciousness or something like that? More familiar terms. Um, and I remember, you know, in our class discussion, people asking you that question. Like, oh, when Heidegger says Dazan, does he mean person? Does he mean self? Does he mean... And, and you were careful to say, no, he said Dasein. So we have to pay attention to that. Uh, and so we're like, okay, so what is Dasein? Uh, it's the being for which being is itself an issue. And that clicked something, you know, like if you identify with that kind of being, then you can say, okay, Dasein is, when he, when he talks about Dasein, he's talking about me. Um, that really resonated, this yeah. idea that of your your own being, your own way of being, your own way of life is itself an issue. Uh, we call that existentialism or one of the words we use as an ism it, for that idea is existentialism and that really resonated with me. Uh, um, yeah. Another one is I guess Merleau-Ponty where he says like when we read a text in a way we're making sense of the words uh, but more fundamentally, we're trying to enter the author's way of being. And we get the text, we understand what the author's saying, when we've interjected that way of being yep. into our own, when we start to think in that way or see in that way. Not completely, but it becomes one of the resources available to us. And that's when we get the text. And it happened with Heidegger. Like there's a moment at which it's just alien language and then something clicks and you start to see Dasein at play in your daily life. 
you start to see what concern false solicitude is like, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so those those are kind of key yeah. ideas in philosophy that really resonated. That second one from <clears throat> that you mentioned from Merleau Ponty uh, uh, seems to fit also quite directly with what you were saying about relating to an artwork and and the idea of transforming, mm -hmm. you know, your experience of an environment mm -hmm. or something. So I so it sounds like that's that's kind of how you're imagining what what art should be doing too. Is that right? Yeah. I was just talking to my dad the other day, and uh, so he's retired and he's discovered philosophy, which is kind of amazing. So he's very excited. So he's been taking some classes on Plato and uh, and going online and finding lectures and things like that. Um, and and earlier this week he asked me, so are you interested in aesthetics? Like you're an artist, you you should be interested in aesthetics. And I realized I've never really actually pursued aesthetics. And how weird is that? Um, I mean, I've tried. I have opened a few texts on aesthetics, but I, I guess that door and that avenue didn't open up yeah. through those texts. I'm sure there are; they exist. I just haven't found them. Um, but what I told them was kind of surprised. It surprised me when it came out of my mouth. I said, "Well, I kind of feel like I've been looking for an aesthetic theory that I haven't yet come across in aesthetic in writings about aesthetics." M my little knowledge of at least the aesthetics text that I've opened up uh, seem to always talk about kind of ideas of beauty mm -hmm. or or the pleasure of of encountering a beautiful thing and that's very relevant but for me it's it kind of misses something um, because I've always felt that aesthetic experience has to do more with rupture than beauty it has to do more with disturbance than pleasure it has to do more with uh, having a kind of an alienating encounter with yeah it's when the familiar kind of cracks and becomes mm -hmm. a bit alien that for me is what I would say is the aesthetic experience that I have when I walk, when I go to an art gallery, when I listen to music. When I'm actually having an aesthetic experience, I do feel there's a kind of disruption of the categories that I count on. And I'm sure those categories kind of solidify back <laughs> pretty quickly, but there's something that happened in that moment of disruption that you can hold on to and and explore further and for me that's what aesthetics yep. is um, yeah um, that when you talk that way it actually reminds me of your fairly recent huge show um, form follows fiction so, uh -huh, and, uh -huh. uh, which has now just come out as a book um, because it seems to me that idea you just expressed was kind of part of the guiding idea behind putting such a show together I think. Uh -huh, so I, I wonder uh -huh. if you could say something about that show and about the ideas, what you were trying to do, and, and maybe relate it to this kind of point, if I'm right, uh -huh, to uh -huh, see that connection. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, so, so Fun Falls Fiction was a show, that I, an exhibition that I curated, so I wore my curator's hat. Uh, uh, I curated that three years ago at the Art Museum at the University of Toronto. And the full title of the show is "Art uh, is Form Follows Fiction: Art and Artists in Toronto." So it deal, it's really an exhibition that deals with art and artists in Toronto. So very much focused on this city that I call home. Um, and for the last, I don't know, seven years, nine years, ten years—I don't know how long—I've been thinking quite seriously about narratives of plays. So what are the narratives that inform? my sense of place, our sense of place. How does the place itself produce certain kinds of narratives and not others? Uh, what's the relationship between these narratives and the sense of place? Uh, how do these narratives help us understand, but also misunderstand the place? Does the place have things of its own to say? Uh, submerged narratives, so to speak. Uh, so these, these are the kinds of questions I've been thinking about in that show. Um, the plays that I 
selected is Toronto. That's the word I have for it. Um, but there's different ways to understand place. You know, this encounter here, this moment is a place, this park is a place. Thinking of this as Canada is thinking about it as one kind of place. Thinking about it as Turtle Island is another narrative that reveals a different kind right. of place. Exactly. And, and that is something that has uh, interested me a great deal. In researching narratives of place in Toronto, I realized that I started to kind of see a pattern. Um, and it's a, it's a constellation defined by kind of two figures or two images. Uh, on the one hand, there's, there are descriptions of place, of this place, that see in it a vacant lot, mm -hmm. a kind of, oh, there's nothing here, there's nothing interesting here, or uh, um, it's, it's waiting for something real to happen. So that, that's the first figure, this describing the environment as a vacant lot. Yep. Uh, on the other hand, there's the second figure, which describes sometimes the same environment, not from the, as if it was a vacant lot, but as if it was a tangled garden, a kind of proliferating entanglement of life forms and ways of being. Uh, clearly, these things kind of contradict each other. Uh, uh, and in a way, the idea of the tangled garden is a contradiction in itself. Uh, if a garden is ordered nature, the idea of a tangled garden is a bit of a contradiction. Right. It's a bit of a, a disordered, ordered nature. And I'm interested in that kind of other level of contradiction. Anyway, so when I started thinking about this exhibition from Follows Fiction, I started to think about what are some of the constitutive tensions that um, that constitute this place. <clears throat> the kind of, I had an intellectual breakthrough uh, at one point thinking, of, thinking through these things. Um, the breakthrough consisted not in trying to decide which of these figures is right and which is wrong, which is accurate or, and which is inaccurate, which is true and which is false, which is kind of my first temptation is, okay, is the, the vacant lot true and the yeah. tangle gardens false or is the tangle garden correct and the vacant lot incorrect um the, the 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 something clicked when i realized oh it's not picking a side that's the that's the most productive thing it's actually seeing what the tension between those things is about that it's those two figures need each other and are bound up together in this place and they generate a kind of energy field mm -hmm. a force field a tension and that the tension is the implicit narrative that these figures are trying to kind of uh, emanate or or energize um, so once I start, I stop trying to pick a side yeah. and advocate as a, as a curator, or as an artist for the side I happen to pick. Once I started to kind of see what happens in the tension and that the tension is what the culture of this place is trying to point us towards, uh, then things just opened up. Yeah. I started to see dimensions and art that I was familiar with in new ways. I started to connect to art that I couldn't connect to previously uh, uh, and so this this focusing on tensions I guess on constitutive tensions uh, um, I think it's something that philosophy is good at yeah. Can I uh -huh. interrupt? Yeah, I mean, please. I guess it seemed to me that in that show and in, the, and in the ideas you're talking about one of the effects of that is that if someone comes like me who lives in Toronto um, it, it does have the effect uh, of kind of changing how you experience the place. So, uh, you know, it, in a way, mm -hmm. it just seems like this familiar place. Mm -hmm. It has these features. But, you know, in your show, looking through the history of the city and especially the history of representations of the city, 
one or I or someone, you know, starts to see this not so much as a thing that's just happening around us, but as a, well, it's almost like the city is in a certain way curated. Like it's a, it's a decision about how you're going to interpret the place and mm-hmm. you can both see what some of those forces are that have gone into making it this way and so on. So I guess I was thinking that, that that show in a way is, a, is um, in part, or was I guess, but the book will be. Uh, a kind of invitation to um, an opportunity to kind of take apart my own or one's own perception of the place they're living in or something mm-hmm. something like mm-hmm. that and make it an issue yeah exactly like exactly. we think we know where we are and that's important we, we need to have some sense of where we are some habituated internalized assumptions about the way things are the way things work, my place in it, my relationship to other things. So in a way, those assumptions are necessary to kind of prop up a certain uh, daily coherence or something. Um, But to suddenly say, actually, this place is made up of tensions that run all through it is to make those assumptions uh, question again yeah. make the sense of place an issue uh, in the way that we were talking about that sign yeah I mean interestingly there too both of the images you talked about the vacant lot and the tangled garden well certainly the vacant lot but I but I think the tangled garden too like they're both very politically charged mm, uh, mm. notions As, especially with the vacant lot uh, it's kind of shocking to come to a country and think oh it's a vacant lot mm-hmm, so mm-hmm, so I wonder mm-hmm. if you have any thoughts there about the the political mm. significance of those two issues mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. which is in then informing our mm-hmm, our mm-hmm. place and our sense of place uh, and you know do you, do you have a, something to say about those the, those issues in in the context of Toronto or in the context of Canada or something like that uh-huh, uh-huh. yeah I mean when I hear the word vacant law or the phrase vacant law I think of of real estate, yeah. uh, I think of uh, a capitalist outlook on the environment as as real estate, as property. Uh, the vacant lot is kind of the fundament of the idea of property. Uh, this is yeah, my exactly. allotment. This is my lot. This is your lot. Um, and in my lot, I can do what I want because I own it. It's my property. So, so the, the phrase vacant lot has a kind of politics around capitalism, yep. ideas about capitalism. Um, and it also resonates in my mind with uh, issues pertaining to colonialism. Yep. Uh, the very notion of the new world or uh, as if it's my arrival as a settler here is day one yeah. I mean that's a powerful vacant lot one is producing yeah. uh, by erasing uh, vacating everything that preceded me and making my presence here as the central obviously central and obviously dominating reference point yeah. uh, so, so thinking about the vacant lot also allows one to think about the capitalist real reality of this place, the colonial reality of this place, and entanglement, I think, th- th- this yeah. idea of the Tangle Garden, allows, opens up questions of how do we contend with deep difference? Mm-hmm. How do we contend with mutuality? Uh, how do we contend with ecosystem with living together uh, um, given the capitalist reality given the colonial reality how do we navigate uh, uh, our entanglements our the fact of our coexistence but not because we're the same or similar or congruent uh, also because we're different and incongruent and um, and 
there are elements of domination in our relationships. Uh, so, how, so, so yes, there are, there are politics uh, that these terms uh, open up uh, quite quickly. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, I mean, I wonder if I could ask just mm -hmm. uh, one different, a different kind of question, mm -hmm. which I hope you won't mind. Just sort of a more, I think it's more personal. Not that these mm -hmm. other things aren't personal, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. uh, but the, more about you. I guess it's, it was interesting to me when you were talking about yourself in high school. This is this is going in a different direction, but, uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, but it might come back to it. When you were talking about um, yourself in high school, you know, you were talking about these things you did, uh, which in a way seem kind of small, like just somebody mm -hmm, doing something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. In a, at a certain level, to me from the outside, it doesn't seem like you've ever exactly changed that practice. Obviously you uh -huh, are a uh -huh, professional uh -huh, uh -huh. in some sense, uh -huh, uh -huh. but but it's interesting that the thing you are, in talking about your own artistic practice, you go back and talk about little things a high school student was doing, which mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm, presumably mm -hmm, aren't gonna make mm -hmm. it onto the world stage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so the, 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 the person, mm -hmm. the sense in which I was gonna ask you a personal question is I wondered mm -hmm. if you had reflections on that about the the orientation you bring to the worth of your own work which which I want to ask you in mm -hmm. particular because you've you know gone on to be pretty successful I try <laughs> <laughs> and I've been fortunate but uh, yeah what an interesting question I have never heard anybody ask that about uh, uh, how one ascribes importance to one's own work yeah. uh, and what a fundamental question it's surprising that that's not more often and explicitly asked um, it's funny like quite early on uh, I realized that art is a way of uh, producing myself, like m making myself. You know, like I guess I, I guess it's like that classic idea of existentialism that myself doesn't pre-exist me. Yeah. It, myself actually comes about through how I exist. So okay, so it's not that weird to say. <laughs> Existentialists have said this. Um, I saw that art, making stuff, making things, is a way of uh, 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 constructing how I am. And, I, and there's a dimension in which, there's an element in which I, one does that projectively. Like you, I, I always, often think about that, uh, story is it Hansel and Gretel about the kids who leave breadcrumbs oh, yeah, so right. that they can find their way back so I feel like oh, life nice. is kind of like that it's like you you walk you don't really know where you're going you don't know if you've made the right choice or the wrong choice you don't know what's gonna happen as a consequence of this decision but you go because you have to uh, and you kind of leave breadcrumbs and sometimes you need those things to kind of retrace your steps so that you can choose differently yeah um, and so that's retroactive. You kind of like, you know, leave breadcrumbs to as evidence of your passing. But I saw it also as projective. You're almost like you throw breadcrumbs in front of you to show you where you've been. And I needed that. Like I, there, I, I very much needed that. I don't know why, but I needed to know that I'm throwing breadcrumbs for my future self to look back on because the future self is going to need those things uh, and I'm so grateful that humans can do that yeah. um, and so those breadcrumbs are, are important uh, whether they're like a little shitty photocopied doodle or something that took you know <laughs> a lot of time and money to make they're equally valid or equally important as breadcrumbs uh, uh, from the point of view of the maker so for my own sake I need these things in my life but 
I also expect, I assume, that we as a collective need people to do that to constitute the reference point yeah. of something we call culture. You know, that another artist or another author or another person left their breadcrumbs yeah, that then I can refer to to orient myself yeah. in this path that I have little map for. Um, uh, it's not just an idiosyncratic need of Louis, an artist, uh, to count on these breadcrumbs, but insofar as we participate in culture, uh, we, we say we, we value these things and we re need these things. Um, it's so nice that Merleau-Ponty spent all his time writing a book rather than hanging out with his friends. Yeah. Uh, you know, doing, I'm sure, sometimes very tedious work for him. Uh, but he, that book, that text, contains his insights, his eurekas, his, his particular mode of being which his experience showed him and he worked on paying attention to. And then because he did that labor, you and I can read that book and have those milestones available yeah. to us as our own reference points. We might disagree or agree with what he says, but we still have to orient ourselves around his landmarks, his guiding, his mileposts, or whatever the word is. Um, and that's what we do. We, we navigate the cultural space, uh, and every space is a cultural space, uh, by referring to these breadcrumbs. Uh, and they're, they can matter to us. It can be actually quite useful. Yeah. Um, let, let me just ask one more thing, maybe bringing this together, and then we could we could wrap it up. But um, I guess it also seems to me that uh, you know your recent work, you know, like cur curating the show and so on, to me seems like a version of the same thing you were probably doing when you were 16 mm -hmm, years old or whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In the sense that uh, it doesn't seem to me that you're you're putting on a show to advocate some sort of theoretical point though there may be a lot of theory in it but that it's part of the same project of you uh, mm -hmm. digesting your environment and you know making yourself and so on so I wonder if that seems true mm -hmm. and if so I wonder mm -hmm. if you could say anything about your sense of the either the continuity or the discontinuity of your current self and your uh -huh, teenage uh -huh, artist self uh -huh. it's very funny I recently came across uh, a little photocopied book work that I made in 1996 that I kind of had forgotten about, but it, it's on my table now. Uh, and I remember being, I don't know, how old was I? Like 25, 26, 27, I can't do the math right now. But, um, so I was a young artist, a young person. Uh, and I made a book work called Some Jungle. And on the inside flap, of the book I have the caption of the Tangled Garden That's which funny. is which is a painting by J.H. Bogdonald he's one of these group of seven painters so I made a the zine this book work called Some Jungle where I, I explicitly refer to Tangled Garden and then I'm, I'm looking at it and it's crazy it's just this weird collage of things that were in my brain at that time uh, I'm glad I did that because now that I'm 50, I can, I can think about what is it about that idea of the Tangled Garden that even before I could have a theory about it, as I do now, I marked it as relevant. Uh, it's weird, it's uncanny. Like it's, it's very weird that uh, there's a, an, an aspect of the self that I am but that I have to wait until I'm 50 to and meet. Like, you know, like... That's very interesting, yeah. Uh, what a bizarre thing. Um, uh, yeah. Maybe one last thing. Yeah. I'm trying to think of why, why, am I, why is the Tango Garden relevant? I don't do gardening. I'm not very naturey. I don't know how to grow stuff. Uh, so it's not like I'm deeply committed to gardening. Uh, I'm very city, like in in a bad way. <laughs> um, uh, um, 
but the idea of garden of garden of cultivating something I guess it's important even without my green thumb but let me tell you something like okay so like these last few years I've been riding around with my camera and taking pictures because I'm trying to make images of my environment and it, that's easier said than done like it's very easy to click and make a picture but it's very hard to know how to make a meaningful picture uh, anyway so there's that uh, my point is through doing that I've been taking pictures of some gardens so kind of evidence of a community garden or just one person who makes a little plot in the back of their building to grow something and those are nice those those resonate with me I kind of feel t touched when I see that and when I try to make an render that as an image so I've been doing that for the last three four years and now when I go around my bike to those sites almost as a rule the gardens are gone Ooh. the vacant law <laughs> vacates the garden almost as a rule it's really weird this place okay there, there's a poem by Dion Brand uh, she wrote a, a series of poems called Winter Elegies and one of them she says the superintendent is at it again she's tearing up the plants in the garden uh, each June she plants them each September she tears them out just as they are blooming this business of dying so often and so soon is getting to me I just feel like she nailed it yeah. she nailed something that happens here is each June we plant something each September we pluck it up just as it is blooming this business of dying so often and so soon is getting to me so you know as a kid in high school I needed to do something to change my environment today I need to curate that show and talk about these ideas because th it gets to me this is getting to me and that has to change I can't live in a place that performs this hostility to itself so readily yeah. and so naturally so as if that's the only way to be I can't live like that I can't live in an environment where that's the only habit available and when I look around there's tons of other narratives that imply other habits and other ways of being uh, if if we can consider them uh, and see ourselves imbricated within the tension that they establish then maybe we can figure other habits I guess yeah 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 well that's great thanks uh, John thanks Louis. it's delightful to talk with you as always yeah I feel the same way